So on this episode of the Whiskey Noobs Podcast, we're going to talk about the main types of whiskey. Um, I'm just going to do a brief overview of all of them, and then they're actually going to be divided into their own episodes later. So for example, bourbon is going to have its own episode. Uh, that way you can get more information about the types. Uh, but I just want to glance over all the different types of whiskey for those folks who are still confused about the terminology. So a lot of people don't realize that whiskey is not just whiskey, right? Like there's not just one type of beverage that is whiskey. It's divided into all these subgroups. And a lot of folks, especially folks that I know, uh, tend to think that like scotch and whiskey are two different things. Um, so I want to talk about the different types of whiskey, the main types, uh, and kind of their subcategories, like I said, really quickly. Uh, and then we're going to go into the distillation process because that is going to be pretty important when talking about the types of whiskey in the episodes to come where I'm going to talk about the specific type of whiskey. You're going to need to know a few different things about the distillation process or how whiskey is made in layman ter layman's terms. Uh, so the main types of whiskey, and there are a lot of them, okay, but I'm just going to go through the ones that you see the most often. They are divided up by region, usually, um, although there are some whiskeys that do span a couple different re regions, which is why I think it gets so confusing. So American whiskey is exactly what it sounds like. It's a whiskey made in America. There are standards for all of these types of whiskeys. I just want to preface that. Um, however, American whiskey has a subcategory that is bourbon, and that's a lot of the American whiskeys that you're going to see are bourbons. So a bourbon is a type of American whiskey, and then you have a type of American whiskey that is almost a subtype of bourbon with a little bit extra stuff added to it, and that's a Tennessee whiskey, different from a bourbon. Uh, so you have all those different types, and then also there's like a Kentucky bourbon, which is a bourbon specifically made in Kentucky, although some folks argue that the only bourbon is made in Kentucky, but that's not technically the case. So you got all this different stuff going on with American whiskey. Uh, but once again, all of those are under the umbrella of an American whiskey. Uh, so like I said, I'll get into the specifics in the coming episodes, but I just want to glance over all these. So the next type is Irish whiskey. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's whiskey made in Ireland. Uh, and there are a little bit of different nuances you can have with Irish whiskey, a couple different things going on that will be talked about in the Irish whiskey episode. Um, but not as much going on in terms of subtypes like bourbon. Bourbon's the big one that everybody gets confused, um, but not, not anything like that going on in Ireland, really. Uh, not, no equivalent. Now, scotch is also a type of whiskey. A lot of people get confused and they say that scotch is not whiskey, just like they do with bourbon. Um, but it is a type of whiskey, and it's from Scotland, so it is a scotch whiskey uh, that's what that means. A lot of people don't really realize that. I think maybe before you even know anything about whiskey, you assume it has something to do with like butterscotch or something. It doesn't. It's, it's from Scotland is the point of scotch whiskey. It has very strict rules as to how to be a scotch whiskey, just like the other two types of whiskeys do. But the notable thing about scotch whiskeys are that there are different regions in Scotland, which we'll get into in the episode. But each region sort of carries its own characteristics, usually. Um, and so sometimes just by tasting a scotch, if you have a really uh, fine palate and you've gotten really good at tasting things, uh, sometimes you can tell what region it's from just based on the flavors that you get from it. Um, so there are, there are things like that going on with scotch whiskey, kind of similar to bourbon bourbon, how there are sub-regions almost, um, like, uh, you know, Kentucky bourbon or Tennessee whiskey, which is not really the same as a bourbon. Um, so it's got a similar thing going on over in Scotland. Uh, there are a couple different regions that also um, are pretty popular. The, the two next most popular that I would say are probably Canadian whiskey and Japanese whiskey, um, both of which are what they sound like. They're from those regions, uh, and they also carry their own characteristics. And each of these categories typically has its own flavor profile, its own flavors that you typically get from it and people associate with it. Um, and you'll learn that as we go, and we're going to be drinking all these different types of whiskey. Uh, that way you can uh, taste each of them and you get flavor profiles from different ones so that's something to keep in mind is that maybe you're going to end up liking one type of whiskey more than another 
Now, there are other ones that aren't by region. The most popular, in my opinion, that doesn't have a region associated with it is rye whiskey. A lot of people associate it with American whiskey, but there are also Canadian ryes. Uh, there are different rye whiskeys. All that means is that it's a whiskey that was made with rye. So it, it could totally vary by region. Uh, does not need to necessarily be an American whiskey, although that's what a lot of people associate with rye whiskey. And it's also going to have a super different flavor profile. I think I think that's a really uh, good example of two different American whiskeys is if you get an American rye and an American bourbon, it has to be American to be a bourbon, but if you get an American rye and a bourbon and you put them side by side uh, and taste them, you'll see that there are totally different flavor palettes going on with the two, uh, but they are both American whiskeys. Like I said, if it's an American rye, rye does not have to be American. It's pretty uh, important to note that, I think. But now I want to talk about the distillation process because that's going to be really important. Um, I, I shouldn't say really important. It's just going to be important vocabulary uh, in the coming episodes so that you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about these different whiskeys. So I want to run through that also in case you're curious as to what the distillation process is. Uh, this will be super helpful to you. So it all starts with what's called a mash. Now a mash is you take different ingredients, you mix them up with water, maybe some sugar, uh, and you let them ferment. Now when we're talking about the different types of whiskeys, I'm going to be mentioning a mash bill quite often, the mash bill of the whiskey. And what the mash bill is, it's all the different ingredients in the whiskey by weight, uh, how much of each of them are in there. And that has a huge, huge impact on the flavor of the whiskey. I would argue this probably has more of an impact on the flavor of the whiskey than anything else, and it's also what varies a ton by region. So, for example, in America, you got a lot of corn-based whiskeys. In Scotland, you have a lot of barley-based whiskeys. Uh, a whiskey can be made from any sort of a grain or a cereal that gets fermented, so in case you don't know, that's very different than other spirits like rum is made with molasses, vodka is made with potatoes, whiskey is made with grains, cereals, starches, uh, uh, those sorts of things. I think it's technically just called a type of cereal, but that's not something we use in common language often. So you're talking about corn, rye, barley, wheat. All those sorts of things are going to be in your different whiskeys. And there are rules for how much have to be in a whiskey for it to be considered a certain type of whiskey. So it's important to keep that in mind. And those grains can be either malted or unmalted. Malting is a process that you do to the grain beforehand, changes the flavors that you get out of the grain. Uh, so that is actually important that some will have actually ratios of unmalted and malted. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind. Now, once you have that mash bill, you put everything in by a certain amount of weight or volume, and you mix it all together in water. You let it set for a couple of weeks. This, this time could totally vary on how long you let it set, uh, and it's going to ferment just like a wine or a beer would be. So if you were to stop here and just let it ferment and then drink it, it would be a pretty funky tasting, like basically wine. Uh, it's going to come out. It can come out at a ton of different um, alcohol percentages just like wine can. Um, but that's how it's going to be. It's going to be in the, the lower uh, alcohol percentages. And nobody drinks it like that. It's going to taste super funky. Um, but that is essentially the product that you have after fermentation is done. It's comparable to a horrible tasting wine. So what makes it a spirit and not a wine is that, or any other fermented beverage, is that you're taking it then and you're distilling it. And so what a still is, is that you put that mash, you actually get out, a lot of the times you take out all of the um, solids and you get what's called a wash. You put it in the still uh, and you heat it up until it's boiling and it's going to evaporate into a column or a uh, worm if you're making like moonshine or in a pot still. I think they also call it a worm in a pot still. Um, and it's going to evaporate, go up into that metal tube, and it's going to cool off, and then it's going to condense back down into a liquid and drip out. Now, that what that does is that the alcohol uh, boils and evaporates before the water does that is in that mash or wash, and it makes it much stronger. Uh, that way you're getting almost just the alcohol out of it. 
So it's going to uh, become much stronger, and it's going to carry some of those flavors with it that it had from the mash bill. And that is one of, like I said, the biggest impacts. Uh, the other biggest impact would be how you age it, which we'll get to. Uh, but that mash bill does come through. Uh, you do get flavor from it. A lot of people don't realize that, especially if you've ever tried moonshine um, or if you've just heard about it, you think it's flavorless. It just tastes like alcohol is basically all it tastes like. That's not actually true. Uh, but those characteristics are much more prevalent once it's made into a real whiskey uh, and not a moonshine, which a moonshine is not aged in a barrel. That's why it's clear. So it is going to come out of the still totally clear. Uh, then you're going to age it in a barrel or a cask. Although I should add that for some whiskeys, they do not go straight into the barrel. Now, some whiskeys are charcoal filtered, um, which means they actually drip the whiskey through a layer of charcoal to try to filter it out or sometimes like add a little bit of a flavor to it. Um, and what that does is, like I said, it's mostly made to filter like a charcoal filter. Um, a lot of filters that you buy are actually charcoal filters. So that's the idea. Um, and that's actually a stipulation for some whiskeys. For example, all Tennessee whiskeys, except for one brand, actually have to charcoal filter their whiskey in a process called the Lincoln County process. But most whiskeys probably aren't going to do that charcoal filtering. A lot of them do, though, uh, so it's worth noting. Uh, but a lot of them are then going to go into a barrel or a cask. Now, all that is is exactly what you're picturing in your head when I say barrel, uh, and they're going to put all the whiskey in there and let it age for a certain amount of time. Now, you can also age your whiskey in different types of barrels. So the two big factors going on here are the type of barrel or cask that you're aging your whiskey in, and then also how long you're aging it in each barrel or cask. Some whiskeys will be moved between multiple barrels and casks in order to get multiple different types of flavors on it. So like I said, this is going to be probably your second biggest factor impacting what the whiskey is going to taste like. So um, depending on the type of whiskey, you might be able to use different types of barrels and casks. You might be able to, let's say, age the whiskey in a cask that used to have sherry in it, that maybe sherry was aged in this cask, and then they take that cask and they actually age whiskey in it. That's going to give it a totally different flavor. Uh, so that is a pretty important factor in determining what the flavor is going to be. And they're going to age it there for anywhere from... I can't imagine less than a year, but let's just say a year, up to infinity. Some whiskeys age for so long. Um, usually, anytime you get above like 20 years, it's going to be a pretty expensive whiskey. Um, and you can get higher than that, though. But a lot of your whiskeys are going to be in that sub-20 range. A lot of your middle shelf whiskeys, I should say. Um, and then a lot of whiskeys, they'll make pretty much identical whiskeys, but they'll age at different amounts of years. Uh, and that age is what's going to contribute to what a lot of people call uh, the smoothness of the whiskey. Uh, that, that age, and it'll also contribute to the flavor and the color of the whiskey. How long it's in a barrel for is going to change the color because the barrel is what is adding that color to the whiskey. So for some whiskeys, that's where their life cycle ends. They go from a barrel or a cask to a bottle, and that is what you would call the cask strength whiskey. Um, and I'm going to do an episode kind of comparing cask strength with normal uh, or barrel strength, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and you'll see something like that on the bottle so that you know. And usually those are going to be much stronger whiskeys. They're going to be most likely above 90 proof, but up into the 110s of proofs, uh, which will actually add a little bit of flavor, but we'll kind of get into that because newer folks a lot of times just think it's way too harsh. So some whiskeys, that's where their life ends. Other whiskeys, uh, they might have different types of water added into them, usually a spring water or a distilled water, uh, and those will help to water it down, bring it down to a specific proof. And for a lot of different types of whiskey, there is a limit to how much you can water the whiskey down and still have it considered a that type of whiskey. Uh, for example, for bourbon off the top of my head, it's 80 proof. You can't go below 40% alcohol by volume or 80 proof, as it's called, uh, and still be considered a bourbon. So you're going to see a lot of whiskeys, especially on that middle and lower shelf, you're going to see a lot at that 80 proof point for that reason. Because in the end, uh, they're able to get way more whiskey out of it if they're able to add water to their whiskey. It just makes sense. If you had 100 proof whiskey and you're able to water it down to 80 proof, you're going to have way more come out of the other end. Um, so that is a, a really common, and you're going to see that in a, a lot of whiskeys. It, like I said, if they don't specifically say that they're cask strength, barrel strength, something similar to that on the bottle, uh, then you're not going to, it's not going to be 
that super high strength. Although some of them will just be higher strength and they were still watered down. They're just a really high strength whiskey uh, and you'll have that as well. That's also, I should add, the proof is definitely going to have a large impact on the flavor. So I would probably say in order, uh, in my opinion, just in my experience or my taste buds, uh, I would say that the mash bill makes the biggest difference. And then next you've got how it is aged, what type of barrel it's aged in. Uh, and then you've got how long it is aged. And then from there, probably the proof is going to be one of the biggest factors. I might be forgetting something. Uh, but the mash bill, like I said, is going to be super dependent on region. So I just want to add uh, that. Um, although there are different processes which can totally change the flavor that we will talk about. Um, but those are your most common flavor changers. Those, if you're putting whiskeys into categories, a lot of times you're going to describe it using those different things, and that's going to give people a good idea of what the whiskey is going to taste like. That's the majority of the distillation process. Like I said, there are other little things that can happen. Uh, and I should add that it is important when the whiskey goes into the bottle, depending on what the type of whiskey is. For example, some whiskeys have to be in a bottle before they leave their region in order to be considered a whiskey from that region. Uh, so that is actually also important in characterizing a whiskey. But that is, like I said, pretty much the majority of the distillation process. Uh, it's as much as you need to know for the coming episodes. Uh, if you want to hear more about the distillation process, you can absolutely look it up. Um, it's pretty interesting. However, I don't think it's necessary for the hobby of drinking whiskey um, to know all of that. I just gave you the information that I think you're going to need for talking about whiskey uh, and understanding what people mean. For example, it's really common to say that a whiskey is a high rye whiskey. that It's got a lot of rye in the mash bill. And if you don't know what a mash bill is, you're probably going to be confused. So Hopefully, this has brought everybody up to speed on the distillation process and on the different regions, the different subsets of whiskey. Uh, that way, if you've ever said, that's not a whiskey, that's a bourbon, you can avoid that from now on and sound like an expert just like anybody else. Um, so that's everything that I think you need to know for this episode. Thank you for listening to this episode of Whiskey Noobs. If you like the show, make sure to help spread the word by introducing friends, coworkers, or anyone that you think would be interested. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the show on your favorite streaming platform, rate the show, review the show, and follow on Instagram at whiskey underscore noobs to stay up to date. If you want, you can join the email list by sending an email to whiskeynoobspodcast at gmail.com. You'll then be updated every month on what whiskeys I'll be drinking on the show so you can drink right along with me and review it as we go. Thanks again for listening to the Whiskey Noobs Podcast. Learn to drink, drink to learn. The Whiskey Noobs podcast does not support underage or otherwise irresponsible consumption of alcohol.